why I have trouble identifying as a breast cancer survivor because I feel it's almost in deference to women who have a much more serious time and for whom it's really, really uh, a, an incredibly difficult process. But I think also the reason that I want to talk about it is because when I got diagnosed, if I would have heard the story of somebody like me, it would have made me much less frightened. Once I got the C word, I was like panicked because it's like straight to death. Uh, and to know that, you know, a couple of years later, I sometimes have to kind of remind myself that I had cancer because it feels just like a blip in the road. I had a fight with my gynecologist and she said, you need to have another mammogram. And I said, well, no, I've read that at my age, I only have to go every two years. She said, no, I want you to have one. And I went in and had one and then went in for further testing and she was right, I was wrong. I was first diagnosed with DCIS in 2015. Uh, I had the surgery in October and I went through the month of uh, radiation in January of 2016. I had DCIS and it was um, really a very simple process for me. DCIS is ductal carcinoma in situ. It's encased and I came out with clean margins. I had cancer in two different places, so there was, they weren't sure if they were gonna to have to do two separate incisions, but they were able to catch it all in one. The surgery was very simple, a lumpectomy. I went in in the morning. I think 12 hours later, I walked out, came home, had dinner, watched a movie, went to bed, and went to work the next day. I needed to have uh, radiation. And it was every day for a month. I have to be honest about the radiation. I practice self-meditation and I can go into an alpha state really easily. So while the position was uncomfortable, you know, having to hold that for like 15 minutes, it was an absolute opportunity to meditate. And so here it was in the middle of the day I would go and get to lay down for 15 minutes and, and, and go into an alpha state. I came out refreshed. And toward the end, I think it was the, the getting to the end of the third week, I confessed to the, uh, the staff that I was worried that I was becoming addicted <laughs> to radiation because I said, I'm going to have to really school myself and discipline myself. So I give myself this luxury of 15 minutes every day. I think the most frightening part was getting the phone call from the nurse because I I was convinced that there wasn't a problem. You know, even when I had to go in for a biopsy, it was, oh, you know, they're overreacting. And when the, the frightening moment was when the nurse said, you have cancer. And I didn't hear anything else after that. I feel deep respect for people who really go through serious, serious problems with it. But I think, you know, when I went in for surgery, one of the uh, ideas that a friend had told me was to visualize being surrounded by friends. And so I took in a list of all of the people that I loved and I had my partner read those to me before I went in to surgery. And so I felt like I was just surrounded by, you know, people who loved me. And
the sexualizing of breasts really is part of the the social construction of the experience that we have. Um, one of the advantages of getting older is that you are no longer in the sex object area. And so there's a, a sort of a freedom that comes with that. Had I been diagnosed earlier and needed a mastectomy, would I have made other decisions? I, I don't know that. Um, but I know that I had very clearly decided beforehand that if a lumpectomy wouldn't work and if I had to have a mastectomy that I would not do anything. When I was in high school, junior high, we would stuff toilet paper or Kleenex in our bras and what the heck, I could still do that. <laughs> so what's the need? Yeah, but I, it is a struggle for women because as much as we may want to escape from those social norms, they are so powerful. Um, I feel in some ways lucky that I didn't have to think about making a decision like that. That's the importance of sharing these stories, I think, is, is how do each of us negotiate our health and the, the social pressure that we're living under? I chose not to and I will not contribute to any breast cancer organizations. And the reason that I won't is because they are not dealing with the problem. They're doing Band-Aid measures. It's, it's in their interest for cancer in ways, ironically and horribly in this you know, economic structure that we have, it's in their interest for cancer to continue. And so, you know, it's a personal decision I've made. I understand people supporting those, but I want the underlying causes of cancer to be addressed. I, I remember feeling really angry when I was doing quite a bit of reading and realized that, what is it, 96% of cancer is environmentally caused. And I, I thought, this, there's no reason for me to have this. I came out of it feeling I really need to fight to, you know, the, the chemicals that are coming into the world. If I want to really deal with breast cancer and, and ridding it. The other thing I realized was that the underlying infrastructure of my having a positive experience was that I had health insurance. And I really, throughout the process, thought about how would I be experiencing this if I didn't have health insurance? And so it, it, uh, the other thing on the other side of cancer for me was becoming an incredibly strong proponent of universal health care. It's a right and we should have it. Civilized countries do. If we become civilized, we'll have universal health care. My advice for somebody who's just been diagnosed is to recognize that cancer is not one size fits all. The cancer is there, but the one thing we have control over is how we shape that experience. And I think that's rather than letting it shape us to find a way to, to shape it in a way that, that we negotiate it in the best way we can. Oh, the worst part was the drugs they gave me afterwards, the Oxycontin. Ah, oh, I got off that very quickly and started using marijuana, <laughs> which was, you know, kind of a perk, <laughs> a cancer perk. Uh, I actually, uh, someone close to me made marijuana butter and uh, every night before I'd go to bed and sometimes during the day, I would have a piece of toast with marijuana butter and honey. <laughs> slept like a baby. <laughs> yeah.
So uh, I highly advise, if I had one piece of advice, I would say two pieces. Don't panic and use marijuana and don't use that awful Oxycontin that they'll die, that they'll, they'll give you. I'm participating in the project because I wish that I had known a Sally or heard about her experience when I was diagnosed. I think I would have been much less frightened and would have realized that it's not the end of the road necessarily when you have cancer. The experience today in the studio has been really fun. Um, I think it's, when I came in, I had a very strong sense of community, which is why I wanted to ask, you know, what your relationship was with each other, because these, these were not a bunch of, of unengaged, emotionally professionals. These were professionals who were working with their hearts as well as their, their skills. And uh, I, I felt pampered and honored and uh, hmm. And I'm appreciative of, uh, of all of you and of the experience that I've been able to have today. So thank you. <laughs>